Mine's always on vibrate. Is yeah. that a workplace requirement? <laughs> <laughs> Short answer, yes. Welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I'm Big Z, and I'm joined by two beautiful humans here in front of the <laughs> MTS trailer at UTV Takeover in Coos Bay, Oregon. Uh, we're here on a wonderful Thursday uh, morning. Is it late morning? Yeah, late morning. Yeah. And uh, we are in front of the MTS trailer because these guys are books slammed all the way to the hilt with work. So uh, thanks for taking the time to join Thank me on you. the podcast. Thanks, thanks uh, for having us. Yeah, I wanted to get you on the, on, the, on the podcast for a while, uh, you're, but you're down south in Phoenix and I'm up northwest. We're, we're, so. a, we're a minute away. Yeah, it's, it's a short drive. Yep. Uh, so uh, yeah, tell us what, what's going on. We got Jeep and Ned. Uh, Ned is the, the glamorous side of MTS with uh, the, I wouldn't say that. the beauty cover shots. And uh, <laughs> Jeep's kind of in the deep. Well, he's getting there. I mean, look, it's it's getting longer. So I had, to, I had to cut it. It's too much to manage, man. And with the heat in Arizona, I don't know how Ned puts All up right, with so it. So <laughs> after the after yesterday, yeah, was it yesterday? Was the bad the wind it was real windy? Yesterday. I had to shampoo three times. I went through <laughs> a third of a bottle of conditioner yep. just after yesterday's windstorm. Yeah, me and the beard are uh, quite frequently in the same position. So it gets there. It uh, gets there. So yeah, we're we're in front of the trailer. These guys are busy. They got a full staff of guys. We got we're watching a guy right now wrench on a on a Pro XP. Uh, we have the MTS Pro XP next to us here. We got the Can Ams lined up. We have KWI next to us, um, and uh, just down the road we got Polaris and Can Am and all those guys. And so you can go see the the stock feeling there, and then get your machine tuned up here and and know the difference. So it's pr kind of a cool scenario out here at the show. It's kind of unique to these types of shows. Yeah, it's really cool. Uh, what customers like the most, and we even have customers wait intentionally for events because they like to see the difference immediately right, right after they get their car tuned. Right. And then we're also here on site doing tuning uh, as and far as... And supporting it. Yeah, right? yeah. Tailor fitting cars to customers, making sure that they're happy with their product and really getting all the adjustments fine-tuned to exactly how they drive. And we do that for people that previously got the, got the cars tuned. Uh, yeah, we, we do it pretty much for, for anybody, anybody, any actually. MTS, uh, if, it, if it has an MTS sticker on it and someone needs some help, uh, we're getting them dialed They're in. They're part of the family. You can it show is. up oh, yeah. right away. And the nice thing is you guys have the website. You can go get a spring kit or whatever, do it yourself. But if you mm -hmm. really uh, need to take it to the next level, you can come down to see you at a show and get your car dialed in. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we do that in Glamis as well. We're, uh, we have the trailer out at Glamis from, what is it? October, October to 31st. April. Yeah, to mid-April. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so everybody's been enjoying it. You guys really have been growing over the last couple of years, uh, especially in the dune scene and the desert scene, for sure. Tremendous. Uh, you guys are based out of Phoenix, Arizona. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, and you have a shop down there. Uh, kind of give some uh, backstory of, you know, where did NPS come from? How did you get involved? Like, obviously, two different, drastically different kind of roles in the company, but very important roles uh, in the company. So, so do you want me to start? I'll let you start. All right, you just jump <laughs> in whenever you want. Years ago. Seniority here. We got to... Um, well, MTS kind of started. We we have a, a a big warehouse. We have another company as well. It's a trucking company. We're sitting shy of thirty thousand square feet, and uh, we started doing work for friends and uh, doing some work and and uh, buddies. And it was all free work, and so that's never fun. Right. And uh, well, it's fun at first. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the bro hookup only lasted a little while, and then we're like, okay, we need to start figuring out how to charge for this. You right. start getting too many bros. Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of bros and doing a lot of free work, <laughs> so it kind of just evolved, and uh, a lot of it evolved uh, because of uh, Jeep's dad, Tori. Tori uh, has been building trophy trucks and racing them for. Uh, when did he start? He started at a company called Flying High Super Trucks uh, back in like late 80s mark die the original yeah. owner uh Gosh, that was a long built time one ago. of the first monster trucks it was a toyota pickup and uh he's just uh he's been in the scene forever i mean uh 30 years 30 plus years so he's been a huge mentor yeah. and uh he's taught me everything i know everything he's, ned knows and uh he, he's a geometry genius he understands this he he understands the math there's math behind shock tuning and and right. spring rates he understands it. So he has mentored us in doing what we're doing now, uh, you know, over the last, what, eight, nine years or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Jeep worked at FST for a while. How long did you work there until your dad? Three, uh, three years. So Tori retired. 
he's he's now working at uh, a church as a pastor, and uh, he's living is, his dream. Is he getting out and riding still, or you know what? Uh, not a lot, because he's he's kind of in the service industry now and just helping people out. Right. We still talk on a regular basis, and uh, he's he's just doing his deal. Yeah. And it's been great. Jeep and I have been able to learn from him, and he's helped us out in several situations. And and uh, it just turned into, hey, we're just going to start tuning shocks, okay? And we started with uh, back one of the first Razor 1000s and uh, just started tuning. We were working together. Now, just for a reference, what time frame was that? Was that 2015-ish? Uh, yeah, because we were doing it about... Uh Something, something like that. About, it was right, about right. a year and a half, two years with with my dad. Yeah. So right before the turbo came out. Yes, yeah, it was yes. just before the turbo so came that, out. So at that yeah. point, the thousand had kind of came out, surprised the industry with the amount of yep. travel you can have and yeah. the suspension options you can have. And right before the turbo came out, where they upgraded the shocks to be a little bit more beefy, a little bit more capable. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so they, you were still tuning, uh, kind of that transition from that Rhino centric world. Yep. to the XP1000 world, and you started getting into it then. Yeah, I was really just dabbling. It wasn't even really... Uh... It, it was. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to go hardcore at this. It just started, and then it just started just rolling, rolling and rolling and rolling. We were doing some good work and and uh, putting out a decent product, the customer service. Uh, people love that. Yeah. And uh, we really do at MTS try to put the customer first and the needs. And it's cool because it's not just from ownership it's everybody, and everybody is bought into that. And uh, you can ask any of these guys. Any of these guys will stop what they're doing and, and you know, take care of the customer. Well, I mean, even with what you're doing, most of the time I see you running around with other people's cars that just got tuned, and you're going to go dial them in, make sure that yeah. the tune that was applied to their car is actually what yeah. you need. Yeah. Because you can go, you can hear what they're saying, but it's different yep. to see what they're doing. Yeah. And yeah. there's not a lot of uh, companies out there in just in general in the off-road world that can take their product with you and see that you are applying it not necessarily how you intended to yeah. and make adjustments to it. Yeah. We've kind of nicknamed that the riding tune. And uh, it's been working out great. I've actually, after this is done, I've got two Can-Ams over there somewhere that we're going to go do a riding tune with and, and get it all dialed in. So, so we we're talking about that 2015 time frame. You started dabbling in yep. uh, creating a customer product where you're customer facing and not necessarily a buddy on the weekend. You know, what was that transition into into business, and how did you make that kind of take off and grow? It was slow. It, it was slow, and there's uh, an education part of that, right? Like, oh yeah, no, it was there was there was a there was a learning period for sure. Um, we had to create something that was good enough to sell. And that you, took a while. Yeah, UTVs are, are, are unique in the sense that you have one shock per corner. Um, and before internal bypass, you know, trophy trucks have, you know, four and a half inch shocks, <laughs> seven tube bypass. Yep. There's a lot more external adjustability versus, you know, the original cars. It's you have a clicker that goes stiffer or softer. There's no external rebound, no, no low speed, no nothing. So, and no staging either. Right. So you really... Not saying that it's harder by any means, but um, you, you're, you're stuck with a certain geometry that you have to work with. Right. Um, and, you know, shock packages are only and, as and good early as, on, those machines, the shock packages that were being developed by Fox and all those guys were very purpose-built. Yeah. Because they didn't really know the industry was going to be what it is currently, right? Yeah. No, they had no and, idea. And so these shocks were like, oh, yeah, we, we do technically have these off-road shocks that we could put on these cars. Okay, let's develop that into a single product line, right? Those those first two O's, mm -hmm. those first two fives, um, and then the three the O's when the turbo came out, right? Yeah. Um, and so that progression was really kind of a learning pattern for Fox and, and, and Walker Evans that came in later and, and all those yep. other guys. And it was more of like, you know, we're going to see where this goes versus we have the ultimate package right away. And so you guys were right at the cusp of figuring all this out along with them, right? Yeah. Yep. It, uh, once again, we just started tuning the car and how good can we make it? And uh, the way that we attack tuning is we will tune for uh, low speed, the slow stuff, the little chattery stuff. We we tune that first, and then we get into balancing the car at the high speeds. And uh, we've been known for having some pretty plush cars. Yeah. And, and very plush and very capable. And, and the early shocks didn't really have a lot of those adjustments, right? It was either one end or the other? Yeah, on the Walker Evans, all the non-internal bypass cars, um, you have to 
try a lot harder. Like there's there's more tricks you got to throw in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you got to get creative on spring rates as well. Yeah, spring rates, and valving, where pistons, your, where, your, where your crossovers engage, and uh, what the customer wants. Mm-hmm. And once again, that comes back around to you know doing a ride and tune, and uh, just helping customers that don't feel like they're fully dialed in, getting them getting it in the right spot because every car is different. Every car requires a little bit different preload. Uh, the settings, there's not too many people out here that have the same same settings. Yeah, you can go to the Dunes, and you would expect that the Dune package would be pretty universal, but it's not. No, each car is different. Yeah. <laughs> each car is different. It's it, it's not a cookie cutter. It's just, Every the, car requires something a little different. And the thing that people don't realize is that if you go on the spec sheet on the car right now, if you go up pull a Polaris website, Cam's website, whatever, they'll have their, their capacity, right? Their capacity mm-hmm. weight for the car. Mm-hmm. And that is basically telling you what your spring capacity is for the car, right? Like it's saying, we're going to dial it into this ca- range between whatever 1800 yeah. pounds and 1600 pounds or whatever the case is mm-hmm. and uh once you exceed that with cooler with upgrades with lighting with roofs racks whatever plus you and your family yep. or whatever the case is you now have exceeded that capacity and no longer in the capacity of the oe shock right so jeep can take us through a little run go ahead and explain what we do when we start with a car give us the rundown jeep on what we do and how we get to a spring rate so when a new model comes out, um, not necessarily a new model, but uh, like when the Pro XPs came out, they changed the geometry completely from you know just a regular turbo razor. Cars come in, uh, and it's usually we base it off of a stock car initially. So the car gets four corner scaled um, with one, two, three, and four people. To, you know whether it's a two or four seat, um, and then the car actually we swing the cars, we take the shocks off. Cycle the suspension, uh, check motion ratios, um, leverage points, <clears throat> you know, how long is the arm, where's the shock mounted on the arm, what's the ratio of where the shock's mounted on between the two pivot points. And then um, we actually have an equation that spits out what's called a ride rate. Yep. Um, now, depending on geometry, that ride rate can be tuned, um, but that's just your base starting point right. that we start with. And your ride rate is what your two springs combined rate is compressed at one inch so dual rate versus single rate um, so if you have a 500 pound spring you compress it one inch it's 500 pounds but if you have 500 pounds of force to do so yeah so if you have 250 over 250 in a lot of people's minds they think that that's 500 pounds but they actually dilute each other by half okay so um we create a spring combination, length and rate, throw it on the car and go test it. And then from there, obviously there's a lot more testing, uh, fine tuning tender springs, main springs, lengths, right. weights, everything. And that's the first step, right? <laughs> that's like, the first yeah. step. It's getting the car to be balanced on the springs correctly mm-hmm. and, and that it'll ride correctly before you even consider valving or shims or anything that you're working yeah. with in the spring. Spring cut's the always truck. done first. Well, and make yeah. sure that ride height's tunable too, you know, cause you know, you, not everybody wants their car to sit as tall as we may recommend they have their car at. So some guys want it lower, some guys want it taller. Um, it just depends. Right. So you need to make sure that you have a rate that's somewhat universal. Adjustable. Yeah. And then depending on what guys do, you yeah. change it from there. Right. So let's step back a little bit. Uh, back when you were developing these packages and you started creating an actual viable product that was being sold, and you were like, okay, I'm going to establish these kind of levels of shock packages. What's changed from that initial group versus where it's at now? Our talent level. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've learned a lot. We've, uh, every time we go out tuning, we learn. Yeah. yeah. Every single car we learn, and, uh, and we just save that in the tuning bank, and uh, it's applied to future cars. Yeah. And there's things that we will pull out that we did uh, years ago. Mm-hmm and apply it to new cars yeah and the, and the, the models changed a little bit you know because obviously we've developed a lot more products and a lot of the stock parts internally we're not using anymore um but like like pistons for instance uh we we, we changed the stock pistons and replace it with our own proprietary one um that allows us to tune a little different than we used yeah. to we go about it different like we, uh, like I said earlier, we, we start tuning low speed. First thing we do in a car when we get a, a, a base stack started, the, the first stack, 
we go out and we start tuning. Uh, we have a river bottom, what, five miles away from our shop? Yeah. We drive the car out there mm-hmm. and we check all low speed rocks. How There's is tons it comfortable? Of chatter. It, yeah. The chatter, the, the stuff that people, you know, for instance, when it's wet out here, there's, there's nothing worse. I mean, here in Oregon, right. it gets so sharp and choppy, and and that's the stuff that we initially tune for. Mm-hmm. And after that, we move on to the high speed stuff. Yeah, cars go to multiple different areas too. It, you know, it's we obviously have Arizona desert, and then Glamis is the main two, but then you have other areas like. San Hollow, you have guys that rock crawl, you have guys on the East Coast that rock bounce, mm. you have guys that... That's a whole different tune, and we, we learned a lot. We were working with Slick Rock and uh, <clears throat> helping helping create some tunes for that group and learned a lot by doing that. Yeah. What are, what are, what is just the basic overview of the difference between a desert car and a rock crawler and how you approach the tuning? Spring well, rates, for one. Spring rates probably the, the number one, and then a lot of the rock crawlers are going to want a little bit more rebound and softer on the compression. Yeah. Because you don't want the thing bouncing off the rock, right? So the the less any uh, jagged movement when you're at a forty yeah. degree tilt on a rock yeah. with, with tire in the air is probably not. It's a good not thing. comforting. <laughs> it's not comforting. We've spent a lot of time in Moab, so we've learned a lot. So we know what that group wants, and we've tuned for it, and we've, we've created some really good tunes um, for people that want to spend a lot of time in the mountains, uh, rock crawling, and we know how to set the cars up. It's not just tuning the shocks. It's a, there's a setup when you go to Moab. Yeah, luckily we've been doing this long enough now that Ned and I are able to, just based off of what a customer is able to tell us information-wise, um, we know what to change internally, externally to get that customer at a really good starting point. Yeah. And even when new models come out, um, just being able to look at you know just what the numbers say after scaling it um, and cycling it, it's, it's we're, we, we're, where we are able to start now is 10 steps ahead. Um, we get there quick. Oh, yeah. We can Once get there quick. Once you have your, da- your data foundation, it's kind of mm-hmm. like a pyramid, right? Once yeah. you get the foundation mm-hmm. set nice and strong, you can start to yeah. build up quickly. Yeah, but it's it's still a lot of work. I mean, it's... <laughs> it's, it's a lot. It's you know, a it's, lot it's, of it's weeks on. of tuning. And then you weeks get cars like when KRX came out, right? Like mm-hmm. totally the shock different. size was completely different. Mm-hmm. And your the, shock was right on top of the tire. Yeah. Changes everything. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, you'd be further in the trailing arm or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's a lot of characteristics that each OE differently has affected your ability to tune it, right? Um, and so, like, now we have a KRX fork out that's coming out. I can't wait to get that. That's going to be great. The, so the mountain guys that. Uh, that do a lot of trail <laughs> <Me>. lighting, <clears throat> they, you're going to love it. <laughs> it's very capable. One thing I really like about, there are actually two things, the clutching and the power steering on the Kawasaki was second to none. And I know that's why you guys like it so much up yeah. here in the mountains. Yeah. It's great. So it's going to be even, even better than the two-seater. It's going to be plush. It's going to be... We'll be able to make it a Cadillac. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to tune it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it feels, compared to other OE cars, it almost feels like a Cadillac from the showroom. Uh, and being able to put some better spring rates into it and putting some better you know mm-hmm. ability into the shock to do its job, uh, I can't imagine how comfortable that car would be. I mean, it's got oh, so yeah. much room and, and capability in it. So, And, and I'm not a high, high – I love high speed, don't get me wrong. I, you, I go out with everybody and, and mm, go full yeah. tilt. But, uh, you know, there's nothing better than enjoying – you know, the, the mountains and the views with the family yep. and, and just soaking it all in and in comfort and not necessarily, Well, there was you know, a guy uh, on the industry ride two nights ago. He was in a Kawasaki. He, yeah, he was keeping was up. He? he was hauling butt. Yeah. He, he was motoring. We were next to each he other quite a bit. Yeah. Well, they're, yep. they're very capable. I mean, uh, even the race cars, uh, yeah. there's a couple of guys that are using them in Best in the Desert and Score yep. and... They're doing they're, just fine. They're I was impressed. Good. He was right next to me and he was just getting after. I was like, that's cool. Yeah, no, I can't wait to get my myself into one of those. It's really kind of the one I'm looking at right now. Yeah, that'd be a good one. So maybe a supercharger on it or something. When's it supposed to be out? Uh, It's available for order now. Oh, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, you can get out and get an order in. So, are they live valve or non live valve? The first they have go? both. They have both. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, they have the ES yeah. with the live valves in it. I That'd love it. Cool. I love it when they offer two different types. It's just more we get to tune. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. Well, I love speaking it. of it, I mean, we we are looking at now live valve across the board right like it, initially it was polaris mm-hmm. had the, the yep. grip on it mm-hmm. and then they came out with the iqs and then they came out with the live valve licensing for everybody else so the oh sorry i was gonna say now we have honda kawasaki polaris yeah. can-am you know yeah. they all have it uh kind of how did that change your guys's approach to it is it just one more thing or is there anything special with a uh, controlled uh, valve? i personally love it i love the electronics it's it just more opportunity to make a car more plush and then more capable at high speeds. Polaris, Polaris has figured it out. Polaris has the ride command, right, which is what sets the live valve apart from 
everybody else's, you know. <clears throat> the ride command they're sampling a little faster than most of the other ones, right? Yeah, so like the was it the, the Pro R is like the perfect example. Um That's a great car. It's amazing. So the ride command actually changes what the valve is doing actively. Right. And it, it wasn't really doing much on the Turbo S's. And it on was the, just going in and out on those ones, right? Yeah, well, on it, the would, 10s, it the would versions. change it based off of speed and braking and a, a few other factors. But I think they got it a lot more dialed in um, in how sensitive and how much it actually does change in the Pro R's because they also have the rebound adjuster as well now, too. Um, and they offer four modes now? Yeah, yeah. It's what do you have? You have comfort, you have track, you have uh, Baja. Rock. There was another one, isn't rock. it? Rock. Yeah. rock, yeah. And those those are all different settings. Those are all algorithm changes to how yep. the shock changes. Yeah. They're not like saying yeah. it's going to go from soft to hard. It's saying the algorithm of how it handles that data flow Correct. from the sensors is going to change yep. and, and how it reacts and the speed it does and, and all that. It's cool because not everybody drives the same perfect example. We were testing the Pro R out at Glamis, created a tune, and by the way, that tune was absolutely amazing. Yeah. It it feels like you're on a cloud. It feels like you're just cheating, like you're not really driving the car. So I get in it and I drive it. I loved comfort, and then I just use the button if you ever need it for G outs. Right. Uh, another gentleman get, gets in it, and he loved the Baja setting. He said, I just like how the car's pitched. I like I like the way it reacts. I like more rebound in the rear. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's cool harder. because they gave us options. Everybody drives different. And now with what they're giving us, it's really cool. I mean, it's a it's a driver's car. So what, when you're looking at those, is, it's, it's awesome. When you're looking at those programs, right, those those changes in how it reacts across the range of motion. Are you fighting? Because I mean, if you if you consider comfort for for a program, it's going to be everything slow to re is the squishy and, mm. and and fast to rebound and all that stuff. And then you go to Baja, where it's like it's going to take those harder impacts. Yeah. Um, does that change how you approach the data logging for like how you kind of narrow it down? Oh yeah, no, it. Uh... We go through all of it when we're tuning it. We're testing. I mean, because we might have to make changes because of comfort versus Baja. Yeah. Right. right. And so we got to test them all out. And uh, at that point, then we were like, okay, it works great with this. It works great with rock. It works great in comfort. This is a good all around tune. And back to what we were talking about earlier is it, it doesn't just get tested in Glamis. It's, there's rocks, river bottom. Uh, there's some places around Phoenix that really. Oh, well, I mean, we went out to Four Peaks, Butcher Jones, uh, yeah. Apache Junction. We went all across the there's whole a state. Lot of you know, and then just for that one tune. Yeah, and then we've we've uh, we've been able to um, obviously do a couple and have some people do some testing in other states for us as well. And yeah. we have a, a variety of people at MTS uh, that drive different, and we're trying to really get to hey, what do the masses want? And it's cool because everybody drives. I, I drive different than Jeep. I drive a lot slower, and uh, I drive like an old man, don't I? <laughs> well, I think you think you do, but <laughs> oh, I do. It's hard and, to keep up with you guys. And that's the thing is, is there's so much variation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times we as consumers, we like to think that it should be just a pretty black and white decision process. I want more comfort. What is it? Right. And, and that's not necessarily the case. Does horsepower and the way you throttle your car play into how it responds? Because I look at some of these cars out here and oh, yeah. they pin it and then the whole bottom end just drags. Mm -hmm. Right. What? Um, and then you look at some other cars where they, they pin it and the whole car just sits there on top spinning mm -hmm. tires. So how does that come into how you consider to tune that? The big horsepower cars, we have to change things. It creates a lot more ground force. And so, yeah, it's going to require a different setup. Yeah, and then you have you have driver style. I mean, some guys know how to check up and throttle through corners, and some guys like to break through a whole corner and throttle out of it. Um, and same thing with G out. Some guys just know how to drive through a G out. So it really depends, and that's where having everybody else drive it yeah. at the MTS group, it, it works out great. That way, we get an idea. Hey, the masses, the the the, the large variety of driving styles. Yeah, and so we let several people get out and drive it. And then once everybody says, hey, man, I, we, this is neat. We really like it. Then we sell it. And that's where we've <laughs> uh, realized that there's a huge need yeah. for, especially at events like this, when we can do it. You know, obviously when we do a car in Phoenix, we obviously can't go out with the customer every single time. But we realized a huge need for, for fine-tuning and adjustments. For, we spend for a lot customers. of time video work. 
mm-hmm. like in the evenings during the day. The weekends are the busy time. Yeah, we get a lot of phone uh, calls. We got a lot of phone weekend. calls, and we can do a lot of like like a ride and tune. We could do it virtually. Uh, send some videos. We're going to tell you what to do. We and it's cool for the customer because they learn as we're doing this. Like, oh, okay, that's what you did when the car acted this way, and it's just a teaching moment, and yeah. it helps them get dialed in. They're happy and they learn. Yeah, a well-educated consumer is a happy consumer because they yeah. know that they're they've landed because of a reason, and when they do, and when they feel like they just spent money because they were told to, like that they're not happy at the end of the day. Even if it even if it was a good product, they feel still they feel they still feel sold on it versus somebody that's going to say this is why this is how this is how it reacts when you choose to do so, mm-hmm. and and they're going to walk away with that with an empowerment versus you know a reason why they spent money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about suspension uh and these cars that are now fully capable of doing a lot more than they used to uh what's one of the most common uh missteps or misunderstandings that people have walking away with a brand new car off the showroom floor usually what it's capable Mm. of doing um (laughs) like yes a lot of guys will get uh yxz and go ride with their can-am buddies yeah (laughs) and they're pissed right you know um so well, uh, there, there's a lot of reasons why those YXC guys are pissed. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> but we, we, we're That's really funny. good at setting the expectation of what each individual model is really capable of doing. Yeah. You know, and we maximize what the car is able to do. But if a guy comes in and says, I, I, I ride with a bunch of uh, X3s and he's got a Yamaha, we put the brakes on and say, hey, look, we can make it better. It's not going to do what that car does. We're not going to give you long travel. And, you have to you set know. the expectation because at that moment you can't really. You could be a salesman, um, but like you said, it feels like they've been cheated almost, or, or right. they they didn't get what they were expecting. So what they wanted, really. what they wanted, yeah. yeah. And then, um, it you're not gonna you don't hurt their feelings, but um, you need to you need to let them know that hey, this I, is what this is going to offer you, and this is what the max capability of this car is going to be. I feel like our industry is all of, every time I talk to somebody that's about a reality check, mm. <laughs> like, yeah. like just across the board, like you go to the dunes, reality check, they'll kill you, slow down, like yeah. mm. take it easy. Your car doesn't have the, the travel, like reality check, you can't do that. Uh, Safety wise, you don't got the harnesses, don't do, don't be stupid. Like yeah. there's all these reality checks in our sport that keep us in well, line. That's why you have uh, UTV fails. <laughs> or, well, remember in the beginning we had to, we were having to tell customers to, uh, take it slow at first, and we still do. Cause it's like, hey, this is a whole new car. Yeah. Cause we were having guys out at the dunes, man. They'd be, they're like, dude, I picked up thirty miles an hour. So perfect example of that. We uh, we were out. How long ago did we tune Mike's car? Which from Mike? Metal FX? Oh, uh, two couple months ago. Yeah, about a month ago. So we're two out there. Ago. We we he has a brand new Pro R four C with the dynamics. We tuned it and uh, we get it done. We we went out and drove it, and just to make sure everything was working proper. We we have him get in it. He comes back so stoked. I have the video somewhere of his re, his reaction. I videoed it when he when he came up, and he's like, "Guys, I'm really afraid because this is so comfortable. I feel like I might come up on stuff too fast now." Well, and that's the story of that car. Everybody's going into that car thinking it makes you want do things that you. Yep. It doesn't. You you just do it. You don't think about yeah. the repercussions of it. You don't it. even realize it. You don't realize that yeah. you're already that fast, right? Yep. And then you add on to it a more capable suspension package that makes it even less vague of a thing to understand mm-hmm. uh, and and get have to get used to. And then you put in some of the the security concepts where we have the cage, we have the harnesses. It feels like we're in a missile. Like we can do mm-hmm. whatever we want. You know, the the reality check seems to get further and further away sometimes yeah. for some people. That car feels like a mix between Bigfoot and a Cadillac. I rode in uh, the HDR car with their new long travel kit on it mm-hmm. with Brandon. And honestly, we only hit tail once, and that was because the, yeah. the ruts were deep, right? Yeah. Like, that was the only time, and he wasn't slow. <laughs> no, that, it's a capable car stock, and uh, it, it it's a very good car stock. We just make it – we balance it a little bit better, and uh, it's a lot more plush. What are do you happen to know what the rates are on the on the Pro R from the factory? We wrote them down. I think it's two hundred over. They're not very heavy. It's, it's not. I was gonna say it's not they, very. It seems uh, like they might be a little light, and they're two, two, relying a lot on the valving. Mm-hmm. Two fifty over three hundred, or two hundred over two fifty. Yeah, it's not on the front. It's somewhere close to that. 
And do you think that's because they're trying to focus more on control with the programming versus the shocks or the, the springs? Uh, or, or is it balanced out fairly well? They, they did a good job. They did a better job springing this time, but still yeah. we're seeing issues with the tenders collapsing They're already. They're collapsing again, just like all of them. Yeah. And so so let's talk about that. That's one of the biggest topics on the forums where oh, people yeah. are talking about shocks is, I'm going to replace the tenders. I need some tenders. And a lot of times they just go to a bigger, heavier machine's tenders mm -hmm. instead of buying the right <laughs> ones, right? They're like, yeah. well, I just need stronger ones. So what's yeah. one, which one weighs 400 pounds? I'll just take that one. Uh, is, is that approach truly naive or is it is some some balance there or, or should they just invest up front and make sure that they've got the right product well obviously we would rather they just buy a spring kit <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you're still relying on that stock main spring that's going to sag over time right as well so it turns into a single rate when it when that top spring collapses, you got a single rate now yeah especially at ride height when you get people loaded in it um you know <laughs> and to clear the air that tender spring truly is there to maintain a gap it's not really doing any weight load for you correct well it is in the beginning but just over time man they just they just collapse i mean look at every car here that's got a stock set of springs um uh, razor right there uh, uh, <laughs> yeah it's, so it's it's got a purpose that and one's collapsed running short tenders like that isn't a problem there's a there's a time and a place for them um but if they would just fix that issue you know a lot of a lot of consumers right out the gate would be happy but um so what's what's the difference just so that people listening can be educated what's the difference between having a short tender versus a longer and having a, a true dual rate kind adjustability. of adjustability adjustability and when you say adjustability are you talking about the crossover point yep. yeah yeah whether you run a high crossover whether you run a low cross or whether you, it, it, one could be going to moab versus baja style driving yeah uh, you're going to run a, a, a lower crossover net for the more aggressive style. If you want to articulate more, you're going to raise it up. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a six inch tender, it, you're not getting the adjustability. We don't have a six inch tender in our whole whole fleet. So when we, you, we want the adjustability. We run a typically a longer tender. So when you run a longer tender and you run that crossover up higher, how does that affect its ability to, to soak up what it needs to? Well, you, I mean, the crossover's there for bottom out control and obviously you tune that with the valving as well um, but the higher it goes the less bottom out control you have it's it's the less resistance you have because it crosses over from a dual rate setup to a single rate when that divider engages right so um, typically it's really only there for the last few inches of travel um, on, on a lot of the cars that's the way we do it yeah and then it's we run them like for guys who are rock crawling, it, it's pretty high. Yeah. You know, unless you need to stop a tire from hitting a fender or something, you can run it a little bit lower. But yeah. And that's that's something that people don't realize. It's all tunable. It's all tunable. The mm -hmm. guy that wants to turn and and, and rally, and he's going to run it a lot lower, less body roll. Yeah. And then that's something that I was going to say is, is a lot of people don't realize how much uh, they can do with a spring tune, right? Like they can, they can run bigger tires and limit – where that tire is going to go or allow it to go. Mm -hmm. They can do things like uh, give you more transition so that smaller tires when you're in the dunes work the same as when you're off off road with a knobby tire, right? You can kind of fine tune your balance if you're willing to put the time and effort yeah. and money into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And when people buy our, our kits, they get that. They get our cell phones and, and we're always on call. I mean, my phone never turns off. Yeah. I've had some pretty late freaking calls asking about <laughs> settings on the yeah. weekend right and, well that's uh, why we ride right that's right it's when you're home and you're wanting to fix it <laughs> yeah and uh and, and that's what it's about it's we're able to help these people when they buy the kit adjust to their style of driving it it's easy so when we're talking about the last couple of years with you know everything that's happened and, and how the economy has been changing um you know how how has that impacted the the shock industry and, and the spring tuning industry because i mean we're talking about a resource that is not necessarily a high priority item in the scope of mm -hmm. things right yeah we're worried about it it's uh to me a lot of it revolves around the fuel if you can't afford to go ride you're definitely not going to afford a shock tune you know for us that it, it's pretty uh we're worried about it i think everybody in the industry is it's, it's the same thing industry-wide Fuel, if fuel keeps going up, then people are going to quit playing or they're just going to play less. And instead of uh, 
putting a couple thousand dollars down towards the shock tune. They're going to put towards fuel. Right. So I, I think all of us, the whole industry is probably a little bit worried about that. I'm hoping it doesn't go too much higher. But but it also, what I've talked with a few people about is it opens the door for the non-full uh, build, right? Like the guy that has the car at home, he's like, yeah, I can't afford to put the 15 grand I was going to do at the custom shop, but I can do a yeah. couple grand to make my family ride better. Yeah. Sure. It's hard to say. I mean, forces them to spend their money yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, once once the consumer's gotten past the the harness upgrades and the you know cage and all that stuff, right? That's what we recommend first. When it, I have buddies come to me and they're not really familiar with what we do and and familiar with the cars, they just went out and bought a car. Say, hey, Ned, what do you do? And I was like, well, go get harnesses first, and then cage, and and then move on to you know your suspension, your radios, whatever you want to do, but safety first. Yeah. So I'd rather them spend money on safety than come to us and. Well, I think and, there's and also that. a big safety aspect so, with tuning tuning the shocks too, because like I've yeah. gone from turbos to naturally aspirated cars, and you know Fox shocks <clears> down to wet Walker Evans shocks, and in different OE packages. And one of the things that surprised me going to a base model XP1000 with the Walker Evans was I couldn't turn sharp anymore because every time I did, once I got past that initial turn, it just folded over because the stock setup on those shocks just wasn't set up well for yeah. for what we were doing. Uh, and I think that can totally tie into a safety aspect of keeping your family well secured wow. in the car. We view shock tuning as a safety feature as well, especially let's talk about razors. They have a tendency to do a lot of bucking, uh -huh. and it's a safety it's a safety feature. We our cars fly flat, and uh, there's there's a reason for that. We 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 consider it a safety feature. We don't want someone to 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 buck over and have the chances of a nose dive. Even if they run out of a little bit of talent, we still want them to. Uh, land on all fours and a lot of guys just crank everything to the tightest stiffest setting when they yeah. want to go be crazy on the mm -hmm. dunes or off of stuff and a lot of times that works against them can definitely can yeah so uh when we're when we're looking out here at, at a show versus you know out at the shop in phoenix um do you approach the the tuning aspect any differently or is it kind of uh just optimize for what you can and then move on it starts with the communication with the customer Every, every tune, it doesn't matter where, 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 whether we're here, at the shop, Oklahoma, Utah, wherever, Glamis, it starts with the communication with the customer. And that and, started weeks ago because you guys yeah. were booked solid through yeah. the week before mm -hmm. you even showed up. Oh, yeah. We had people calling in January yeah, wanting to get on. So we were booked weeks and weeks and weeks ago. Yeah. And uh, the, le the last phone call we make to them when we say, hey, look, you're at 9 o'clock, show up at 9 o'clock, that's when we design the tune. And if there's any last minute changes when they come here, then we'll we'll do that. But it's the communication up front, so it doesn't matter where you're at. It's the communication, right? And that's key to customer service across the board, but also more specifically when you're talking about products that are designed for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like a, a tailor is not going to just take a generic pattern and cut you a suit. You know, he's gonna he's gonna measure you up, and that's what we have to do in the off road. You have to figure out. A lot of people lie. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, uh, we, we run into that. that. We we kind of messed <laughs> up early on. <laughs> Wifey weighs 100 pounds, I yeah. guarantee it, right? <laughs> so early well, on, early. it's more so driving style, man. Everyone wants to tell you. It's like they uh, they think we're gonna judge you if you don't drive like Robbie Gordon. <laughs> right. So you know? early on, we uh, we would ask people, and we messed up. We totally screwed up. We uh, we would ask people, so do you drive? You know, a zero is a grandpa, a ten's a Robbie Gordon. How do you drive? Every, every guy was an eight or a nine, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, we retuned a lot of cars because of that. Yeah. And because and we don't we don't ask people that question anymore, um, because every you know, no one wants their manhood insulted. Yeah. I, <laughs> well, in perspective, I'm, right? Like if you've never pushed a two hundred horsepower car through the dunes at full pin, you know your uh -huh. your version of extreme might be yeah. six thousand RPM in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, <laughs> so we that that was interesting. We got away from that quick. But so how do you approach figuring out that riding style from distance? You know, like if I'm calling from Washington, how are you figuring out my riding style over the phone? First of all, it's where do you ride? Coach us up on your terrain, and then we just start asking questions. How do you ride? Are you do you ride slow? Are you an aggressive driver? You you guy? Are you an aggressive guy that gets? Uh, uh, really aggressive. I mean, you got people like Robbie, Blake, uh, John at Dune Destroy. 
these guys aren't the masses. They drive different. Yeah. And uh, we just ask questions that lead up, hey, how do you drive? Where are you at? What's the terrain? Uh, on the sheet that we have at the shop, there's a percentage, how much dunes, how much desert, how much mountains, trail riding. And then uh, we just do our best effort to tailor fit that. Yeah, we just ask them. I mean, every, every, there's, it's a long list of things that we go through. And, you know, spare tire, ice chest, tools, where is it located, um, tire size. Um, you know, there's a ton of factors that go into it, especially if a guy that's got 35s. Tensors versus a guy that's got, you know, can yeah. 32 Arisons. It's a huge difference in ride quality. How much difference is that tire unsprung weight. wheel, the unsprung weight? How unsprung does, weight makes a huge difference. How much difference. difference does that make with how you tune it? Uh, it makes a lot. It makes is a it big difference. Is it just spring rate or is it like considering no, other things? Not necessarily, not necessarily spring rate, more so valving. Because because a lot of people don't really understand the difference between valving and springing, right? Like springing is taking care of your car, making it sit correctly. Well, it's they don't know the difference between rebuilds and valving. Right. That's what we so got to coach so people up so on. So define that for us. Like, so, so rebuilds is maintenance. Is, is the easiest way to explain it. Rebuilds is maintenance, seals, oil. Um, valving is performance, you know. So, so so for the average consumer that comes with, let's just say a 2017 Razor Turbo that has been blowing it through the, the whoops and the dunes for the last few years, you know, his, his shock is going to need probably all the above, but yep. what, how do you gauge if you need to be doing your seals versus actually j- jumping into tuning? Mileage, usually. We say right around 2,000 miles, 2,000, 2,500 miles. Um, you're gonna because need... the, the valving wears out over time, correct? The valving, no, it's the oil. Or I'm sorry, yes, yeah. the oil. You have yeah. the oil and you have your wear band. The wear band, I mean, it's like a motor. Yeah. It's, you got... A piston, you got rings, you have uh, oil, so it needs to be serviced. Yeah, you have a wear band that seals yeah. against the inside of the body, and that's what prevents oil from escaping around the piston. Right, and the, and the nitrogen separation, right? Yeah, yeah. so you got the IFP, that uh, the O-ring will go bad in there, and uh, you know the nitrogen will mix with the oil on the body. And then you got a bomb you got to try to take apart. Because <laughs> that's yeah. a different story, right? Because all the pressure became to the side that you're not mm-hmm. actually taking apart. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you have to take it backwards apart. Yeah. It's, well, we got a... We've got, it's been interesting a couple times. We've had a couple blow-ups. Yeah. We had one uh, just last year in Coos Bay. On a Turbo S, it, uh, it shot the shock shaft into the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, it's it's fun, but... So, so explain to, to people that are unfamiliar with how the nitrogen and the oil work in the shock. The shock has the ability to press against the oil because of the nitrogen. Yep. And what happens, like you're saying, that seal wears out over time and you get leakage. Mm-hmm. And so over time, you, you your shocks will fade faster. They won't rebound as much. Well, now you have... Uh, so the nitrogen's there to prevent cavitation in the oil. So it's like with anything, as the piston is traveling through the oil... Uh, there's resistance and friction, you know, so it creates tiny little air bubbles, uh, which is called cavitation, and it's a pocket of air. And um, even if the shock is completely and totally sealed, it'll still create that air pocket because of the heat. So um, the nitrogen pressures prevent those bubbles from forming. So if you had no nitrogen, you'd go out in, in five minutes, your shocks are foam on the inside. There's, there's no resistance. There's no nothing. Like it went in a blender. Yeah, so that, that's the, but the main purpose of the nitrogen, and then there's a couple other uh, uses for it. You know, yeah, some cars need. But it, the important thing to know is that it wears out over time, and the seals, if they leak, then becomes. Yeah, nitrogen know, pressure needs to be checked constantly. Uh, you know, not constantly, way, but like twice a year, probably. Is there a way that a consumer could do that on their own? Um, they would have to have a uh, a nitrogen bottle and the whole setup, the gauge, whole setup, regulator, yeah. Yeah, so it's really something that you want to work with somebody, a professional or a shop that's certified or Mm -hmm. or whatever the case is. The good thing is our dealer network is growing, and most of our customers can go to a dealer at any point and get nitrogen checked if they live somewhat close. Well, that's why we do reservoir caps as well. And it makes it easier, yeah. So we we go to a straighter valve. Reservoir caps are that cap that's on the end of the reservoir. Uh, All the stock Fox cars have a little rubber pellet, kind of like what's in a basketball, and you would pierce it with a needle to charge it or release it. Now, most of the new cars past 22 are going to be a bolt that you take out. Um, to but, expose that or to... Well, no, to just let all the nitrogen... Just let it all out, right? Yeah, so 
the issue with that is there's not a lot of shops that are qualified to um, be able to do that. It's uh, They just don't have the tools, but they have the nitrogen bottle. So we put a reservoir cap that has a Schrader valve on it, the same thing that's on every tire. Right. And shops that have a nitrogen bottle can charge shocks. Right. And then we just tell the customers what the pressure needs to be at for their gotcha. car. And so when they do get a shock tune and you guys do set the pressures up front and over time, how, how soon are they looking at having to kind of double check and make sure that, you know, everything's good to go? It's a every six month. Well, thing. so for someone that spends a lot of time out in Glamis, you tell them, hey, at the beginning of the season, you could stop by. We do nitrogen for free. Stop by, get it topped off. And then a few months later, midway through the season. Yeah. Check it, it again. It depends how much you ride, too. Yeah. Um, but we yep. say before every, you know, if you're going to go do a big ride, a big, long trip, it's a good idea to check it. Sure. And and a lot of people's version of a big, long trip is over the weekend, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But some other people, like when we go on long rides in the mountains, you know, for 1,500 miles, that's yeah. that's a long trip. That's a long <laughs> ride. <laughs> yeah, no, you need a, it, and it, it depends. Not every guy has access to that. So if they need to wait until right. the next time they see you, then... Um, nitrogen caps are, you know, our, our Schrader caps are a good upgrade because it'll hold the pressure for a lot longer versus those stock ones will leak out over time. Right. What What have been some of the the more fun builds that you've got to, to tune on and make kind of a unique experience? Let's see. Slick Rock cars were cool. That was, it's it so different to go get a portal car and then make it work. Right. And we learned a lot and uh, it's it's helped us with what we currently do. By learning how people outside of Glamis, Baja, Phoenix area drive, and so we learned a lot about that. And the portal cars has been—they've been fun. They really have, and it's cool to ride in them too. I mean, you're up there a lot <laughs> higher. Um, let's, what are some other fun ones? Uh, this one right here is our uh, one of our shop cars, and uh, it's been a blast. It's a long travel kit that we at MTS designed. And uh, yeah, this car is a lot of fun. It's four inches wider each side than a stock Can-Am. And is the shock placement stock placement, or is that a different we, placement? No, it's different. Yeah. It's yeah. changed front and rear. Yep. So it's a little top secret. It's a one-off. It's, one. <laughs> it's a, it's a one-off. And so this is it's a cool car. It has SDI e-click, so we're able to contr fully That's control. That's an interesting system. I think it's really cool. I yeah. love it. I absolutely love it. You can go plush. You can hit a touch of a button. You know, you could go from comfort to Baja style. So, so to, that's not a really common thing in our industry right now. Like people don't really know about it yet. Um, SDI uh, makes a whole bunch of shocks for Jeeps and trucks and stuff like that. Yep. Uh, and they came out with this kind of like a uh, IQS competitor system uh, that you can put on on their on their setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it does allow you to switch between the comfort modes. Sure. Uh, what di what's different about it though, in your opinion, on how that approaches what you do? It's a lot more adjustable than any other system out right now. Because it actually gives you parameters you can change, right? Mm -hmm. You oh, can yeah. independently yeah. change front and rear shocks. Uh, they have throttle sensitivity, brake, steering. Roll. Um, roll. It can detect yaw, which is drifting. Yep. Um, it's got a gimbal in there that you have to actually level. Calibrate. Yeah. And then it, uh, you know, it'll rear load. Uh, you could put, you know, if you got 150 pounds on the bed, you could put that in the system and it'll adjust it for you. What else is there? There's a lot of adjustment on that thing. It, dude, it's so It has much. an old crap button. It's right on the steering wheel. Yep. It goes, oh, it, goes, it goes full stiff. I didn't know it had that. Yep. That's one of my favorite favorite parts about it is I personally like a soft car. Yeah. And so I, I like it really soft, and I'll use the button, you know, anytime we have a G out or anything. And uh, that's just my style. I want to yeah. be comfortable. Yeah. And for it to go from zero to ten, and that's the scale on this, at a click of the button. It's really cool. And you feel it. It's very noticeable. And we're back. So we just took a drink break real quick. They had to go process some <laughs> payments for some customers and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, but uh, just wanted to jump back in and see kind of, you know, we, you, you've developed this whole program of tuning over the last, I don't know, eight years or whatever. Uh, and you've gotten to a point where it's more about just what's the next model. Let's find out what it'll do, what it's capable of and how to tune it. Uh, but what do you see the future bringing into the company, and, and where do you see not only the industry going, but just kind of how the tuning market and what you're doing with these machines going in the future? So, I, obviously, I think it's all economy-based uh, on where this industry goes. But as far as MTS, 
we're really doing a good job of growing our dealer network. And everywhere where there's a, ra a major riding area, we've got a dealer. And we're going to be getting more dealers. Uh, right next to us is 106. And uh, he does a great job. He's one of one of our dealers up there. And he's he does an amazing job up here. And where are they out of? Uh, Medford, Oregon. Okay. And uh, that's going to continue to grow all over. Uh, you know, for that matter, it's going to go anywhere in the world. Yeah, no. Uh, Our kit can go anywhere in the world. It's a, Do you guys ship overseas? Uh, currently, yeah. Uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto, Puerto Rico. Rico. Sinaloa. Yep. Those are the three. Um, I can imagine the guys in like Dubai and stuff are probably itching for some options too. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's just a matter of time. We can't grow faster than we can Support. take care of uh, take care of the customer, their customers, and, and that's big to us. We want to make sure everybody uh, gets that feeling of it just getting dialed in and being able to teach the the dealers how to help them be dialed in as well. And uh, we're just going to keep growing. That's it. MTS is going to keep growing. The dealer network is going to get bigger. The amount of business we do in Phoenix, I don't know if it's going to change much. I mean, we keep growing. But there's only so much just in Phoenix when car people bring their cars to us right. um, that we can get done. There's there's a couple options in Phoenix for people to get their cars tuned. So I think that Phoenix work will always be the same. But what's going to be growing hugely is is definitely the dealer networks around the world. And that changes a lot of things like logistics and shipping pallets it and does. things like that. It We're does. not talking about you know a small Amazon box going across the country, right? We're talking about... <clears throat> Uh, objects that sit inside a cardboard that destroy cardboard. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. What, what they're doing, I mean, w with uh, Seamage is the name in uh, DR in Puerto Rico, is they uh, they basically kind of wait till they could fill a container up. Right. Because he uh, he buys a lot from Evo Rigid, um, so he he comes to the U.S. quite a bit um, and just orders a ton of stuff, and it all ships out from Miami, Miami. somewhere. Yeah, we in ship a, it in a to big Miami. Container. We ship it to Miami. He gets it, and so I think when you go uh, overseas, you're going to run into those the the logistics. Of how do we get it there? Yeah, is it UPS, FedEx, or uh, DHL? How are we going to get it? Do you have to ship it? Is it going overseas uh, via boat, plane, whatever? That'll be interesting in the growth, but I know we'll get through it. I mean, shipping goes around the world. And do you guys just ship the kits, or do you actually build shocks too and then ship those? We, when we have a dealer network and we have a dealer, for example, in the DR, we ship the kit. He installs it. We've already trained him on what to do. He has everything to rebuild a shock, miscellaneous parts, the typical parts that'll break on a shock, um, the eyelets, whatever it is, shock body, shock shafts. He will have those and we ship the kit and anything else that he's wanting us to ship to. So he gets the box. It, it, it's in a 20 by 20 by 10 box, and he'll get it. Everything's inside it that he needs to install the same kit that we're putting on this uh, 1,000, and then this Can-Am right there. They will get that. Yeah, that's actually my the last razor I had was that one right there. Um, so I missed that thing, actually. Uh, being some metal for a second. Uh, the, we got uh, a great tune for that one. That one, <laughs> the Walker Evans four seater. We've done a million of those, and it's uh, it's a great tune. So there's a there's kind of a uh, if you go on like the forums and stuff, and you talk about you know I bought a base model razor. It has the Walker Evans. You know what should I do? Almost everybody's like, go buy new Fox shocks and put them on there. Like, <laughs> it, is there really truly enough you can do with the walker evans to justify staying with them or is there a fine balance between investing in them and jumping up how hard are you going to drive it that needs to be the question uh, for the masses that walker evans shocks with our tune on it is going to work great mm -hmm. uh, someone that wants to take the car to the next level is probably going to need an internal bypass something that has more bottom out control but even then you're limited on what the car's capable of anyways correct with the geometry yes <laughs> so and we've seen walkers be able to do pretty much everything that the internal bypass foxes can do um, to a point. Right. The biggest thing that is the fault in walkers is uh, the amount of time between service. Walkers typically need service. Uh, the breakdown is a little bit yeah, faster. Yeah, more frequently than, uh, than foxes for sure. Yeah. And does that come down to like the the... The valving and the and how much flow it has and all that, it's or the does design it come down of the to, shock? Okay, so it's more about the, the engineering that goes into that that top part of that shock, that yeah, all, where everything's working. 
Yeah, so like like the, and the walker is a two. Uh, it's, it's a, a two point oh on the front, and <laughs> yeah. it's it's a small small shock to be asking it to do what we're our customers are putting them through. Right, and and that's definitely something that the industry is has quote unquote corrected by offering the bigger shocks on yeah. the premium trims, mm-hmm. but they still left a lot to be desired on the entry level ones. <laughs> yeah. um, do you guys find yourself doing uh, a- anything outside of UTV? Like, are you doing quads, dirt bikes? Are you doing snowmobiles? We used to do rails. Rails in the beginning. But uh, they're 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 too. The the problem is is they they're not all. When a razor comes in, you know what you have to do. When a rail comes in, they already have springs that are good. They're not crappy quality springs, and you know the budget that a rail guy is willing to spend doesn't really leave a lot of room. You know because you need to respring the whole car. You have eight shocks now mostly instead of four. Yep. Um, you know the price doubles or triples. And it's a lot more work because each car is a lot different. Right. You know, there's a lot more rails out there as far as variety than there is side by side. We have a good friend that uh, tunes rails. And so we, uh, anymore, we say, hey, call him. He does He does a great job. Yeah. And he's out in Glamis as well. And uh, he doesn't like doing side by sides. And, we, and we're fine <laughs> giving him all that business to do all the sand rails because we are literally that busy. Yeah. And yeah. to get into snowmobiles, to get into motorcycle, we are really that busy uh, with just doing the side by sides. And I think uh, I don't want to deviate from what we're really good at. Yeah. And and jump into something else when we can continue to grow this thing glo- we have a focus. globally. We're focused on the plan. The the, the five year plan is basically what I just said is we're going to keep growing the dealer network. Dealer and network. that's something that's different than other companies that do this, right? Is that they're focused on maintaining that all in house. And and the expansion part of it, it's not about educating a lot of people. It's more about just selling them online. Yeah. Uh, and with the approach of creating a dealer network, you're creating a lot more relationships and a lot yeah. more uh, locality based, you know, interaction. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think I've said every I think for the last 10 episodes, I've talked about supporting our industry by putting our dollars where our mouth are with yeah. our local companies, with our local businesses, with our local um people that are investing back into our community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a great way to do that is to simply say, we're going to bring the industry up together instead of all yeah. in one one city. We want someone to get the same love from Phoenix if they're on the East Coast and the same tune that have the same great ride. That's our goal. That's our goal. And yeah. to keep and continue to grow that. And, and, and growing a dealer network with like-minded people. Right. You know, so it's really important to us that our dealers have the same level of customer service and and quality control as us. You can tell right away if someone's going to go the extra mile. Yeah. And and that and that's pretty easy when you're talking to certain people. And obviously you have uh, social media and uh, to just double check and make sure everybody's on the same page as us, because that's that's huge. Uh, Yeah. I think the forums speak uh, speak pretty loud. We're, We're pretty good at customer service. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've read comments where it's like, you know, call Ned. He, like, he, he'll take care of you. He'll hook you up. He's a good guy. He does, he's honest. He'll be straightforward with you. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that story in some way, shape, or form, oh. you know, about MTS and, and what you're doing. It's the whole group. Of, it's the whole group of guys is the reality. We got uh, – Greg, Greg does a great job. He's on almost every freaking forum out there answering questions. And uh, so he does a good job responding to people as well. I'm not on the forums because I might say something that's <laughs> a little off kilter. So I, I think I've been grounded from those. And uh, the group in general, we got uh, we have another you got partner, a bunch Russ. Of people here, and then a bunch of people not here. Yeah, yep. yeah. So uh, ownership is uh, uh, Russ, Greg, and myself. Um, we share we we own two businesses together: a trucking company and this company. And uh, I spend most of my time with MTS. Russ spends most of his time with with our trucking company, and Greg's about fifty fifty in between the two. Um, you know, collectively, though, when we're having meetings, everybody's everybody's fully involved and uh, make the decision and the paths of, of which way we're going. We have other guys at the shop that aren't here; uh, they're keeping the keeping the house rolling. Um, we got a great group. People like working here, and uh, we're we're very fortunate to be able to work alongside people like G. I feel like he's like my son. I tell his dad all the time. He say, "Hey, we share this kid. He's he's half mine." 
<laughs> well, his hair is about to match. He's getting so. there. Yeah, yeah just getting there. I chopped, I chopped like six inches of it off. I, I think it'll be 60-40 when your hair gets longer. Probably. <laughs> it'll be more mine. We're lucky that we have a team that we do. We really are. Everybody has a vertical that they're really good at, and we stay in that vertical. And uh, uh, everybody does a great job. We're really lucky to have this group. And you and you guys got got you got guys that are willing to kind of work outside their scope, right? Like you come here and you got you know social media guys working yeah. in, on shocks, and you got people. yeah. Christian is new to the business, and uh, that's what he comes from. He's he's been into uh, doing videos. We needed someone that can do a little bit more than just videos, and uh, he's in here bust busting on shocks. I mean, he's he's been training, he's learning, he's right next to the guys in there. Yeah, he jumped right in, man. He didn't uh, he, he didn't hesitate at all. Yeah, no, he, and, and he does a great job. We're lucky to have him, <laughs> and uh, we're just fortunate. I can't say enough about the team of how lucky we are. So how, We're successful because of who we work with. So how big is the team right now that you have in Phoenix and, and go on the road with you, we, and, and how has that grown over the last... It's 10 know. guys. Yeah. It's every bit of 10 guys. It's it's still not um, a huge operation as far as guys are, but we, we pump out a ton of work. Yeah. A lot of kits go out every day, and several cars go out just from inside the shop every day. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. could have, well, with four guys, we'll do 50 cars in a week. Yeah, and then ship, the, ship out a bunch, too. Yeah. And what's the lead time on getting a service down in Phoenix? We're never more than a, a car will never be at our shop more than a week, week and a half. Unless something's broken. Unless something's yeah. broken, something's, yeah. <laughs> if, if we got to wait uh, wait on uh, getting parts in, then, yeah, it's going to be there for a little bit. But a week in the height of the season, which we're going to come up on in a couple months, maybe two weeks. We get through it quick. Two we weeks, really do. Two weeks max, yeah. Yeah. The guys do a great job. I mean, um can't say enough of good things about how quick they get through it as well. It's organized chaos. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It is. That's for it sure. is. Well, I, I'm excited. I mean, there's so much possibility when you consider the tunability and, and the options and the and the personal um, correlation you can have between, uh, you know, the different partners in this process of tuning, right? Yeah. Like, uh, it's not a one one and done type deal, and you can and you can come to events like this and and say, hey, let's follow up on this like little aspect of this. Like, how can we, like you know, uh, Ian was out here with the, with the card and, and it had started to to ro- sag into its its own, right? Uh-huh. And they need to get it a little adjusted, rolled up, fixed it, bam, back on the dunes, right? Like it's not yeah. a big deal. So. Um, obviously you can't just show up and be like, Hey, I blew the piston out yesterday. Can you fix it? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it does I, happen though. I mean, if, if, if it's available and we have a spot open, someone comes in with a problem and we can do it, we're doing it. Well, we, we always, uh, for customers, especially, uh, if we have the parts to do it, we always find time. We try to no keep, questions asked. We try to keep two bays on production and one bay for just service. whatever yeah. <laughs> whatever shows up and whatever's the key because it could be anything if you're dealing with a guy like john from dune and destroy it's everything he will break <laughs> that guy will break everything on the car you're getting called out john <laughs> yeah it's destroying dune he He's, should have renamed uh, yeah, it yeah. the way he drives it's destroying dune he needs to be He's careful a, with the pro r i don't have if he didn't destroy yet. it he might be able to do it I thought but, he already broke something. I was oh, like, another oh. one, Brent. Brent. <laughs> oh, Brent already broke his oh, truck. Oh my yet. gosh! So I'm on that industry ride. I'm right next to him. Oh, he, that's right. He was saying he, you were right next to him. He yeah. jumps off. Uh, it's about an eight foot <laughs> drop off, <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, this car's gonna, this Can Am's gonna look like a dually. The front tires are gonna be in the back, <laughs> and I can't believe it. He drove away from that. So whoever built his front end, SF, yeah, SF. Uh, yeah, shout out to those guys. Those guys are cool. Mike and Dean. De- Deviant. Didn't he, doesn't he have some, has the some arms on it? Arms, yeah. Yeah. So those those companies built, I can't believe it. It held up. Yeah, I didn't. He nosedived it right into this he thing. He like and barn he, darted it. Yeah. And he throttled oh, yeah. out. I'm looking, I'm 15 feet away, looking to the left, <laughs> going, holy crap. That's why you go pro everything, kids. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So shout out to those companies for dealing with Brent and his crazy way of driving. <laughs> That's its own like yeah. special class. Of I think, good I think he aimed for it on purpose. <laughs> I'm going to call that was a on purpose lawn dart. <laughs> he didn't want to compete Saturday. He's like, you know what? 
I got to test and see how strong these yeah, guys whole, build stuff. His whole front end got, or the whole car got rebuilt over the last two weeks. Yeah. yeah. And uh, put together last minute. I mean, uh-huh. completely rebuilt, new motor, new everything. <laughs> and yeah. uh, and then he had to tune it when he got here. He hadn't even put any miles on yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, he sent a shock. He already lawn darted for the event. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and then he lawn darted it, and then the only <laughs> he thing drove that, away. I couldn't believe it. I've never seen anything wrong like it. with it. Is is the the bumper that holds the front end up is yeah. it, you know small tube and mm-hmm. and it yeah. was bent up. And uh, Karen, other than that, did, Karen didn't even fall off. His little hula girl. <laughs> Karen still, she made it through, no problem. Didn't even yep. have a helmet on, but she yep. still, she's, she's still, good. she's living her hips. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So no, I'm excited, and, and I think you guys are doing a great job. And, and obviously, you know, when it comes down to to quality and all that stuff, you're you're not ordering from China and, and all this other stuff. You're you're doing no, it the right it, way. It's American made. It is. That's important. Yeah, and and there's a lot of companies right now in our industry that are consolidating and and selling up, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it, it's nice to see the like I don't want to say family owned, but it, it's like it's a family of people that yeah. that own this this whole idea and are growing it. It's a it t- is, we're actually family. Russ uh, married my wife's first cousin. Greg married my sister. So. <laughs> Hey, you guys got it's some. All I thought we were going to get real North Hills here, real no. quick. No, 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 not like that. But <laughs> we're uh, we're tight. Depends on how many generations you go back, yeah. I guess. Well, there might. I mean, so you might look it is, like it for is a family reason, owned. Well, I'm I'm stoked. You guys, this is a Thursday. You got still another few days here. Uh, are you guys working through Sunday, or are you out Sunday? We're done Saturday. We're going to load up Sunday. Probably go try to go on a fun ride. Get some video work. Christian's just itching to get his drone out. He's got a drone <laughs> well, that with does all this wind we've had. That's been I tough. know he's been struggling. So he said his drone will do close to ninety. Oh yeah, he's got an FPV. Yeah. So yeah. we want to go hit bull run and uh, see how good he is uh, as, as a pilot. <laughs> Through the trees. <laughs> yeah. We want to see what he's got. But anyway, we appreciate you uh, asking us to do this. No, this I, I appreciate fun. you taking the time. Really, is what the more value here is 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 separating you from your team and your and your customers, right? Like, there's so much to do here. And uh, where can we follow you guys? What can we do online to support you guys? And where can we see what you're doing? Instagram, Facebook. Uh, yeah. Um, if you need something? Go to our website. Order it. Mpsoffroad.com. Yeah. Yep. And uh, we get the orders out really quick. If you order it, we're what are we two to three days max? Yeah, it just depends on, on, how, on how busy we are. But yeah, we and parts doing, are always and, in stock. and it's all like if you're doing spring kits, it's all foam it's, uh, packed and all yep. that stuff, right? Oh, yeah. So it's not yeah. going to come half hanging out. And, nope. No, nope. it comes in a box, all taped up, and so far so good. We have some pretty solid boxes, and and uh, they get a lot of MTS tape on them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that might be a problem if you have a neighbor that <laughs> is an off road or two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they might see it. Um, yeah, that would suck. <laughs> But, uh, uh, yeah, enjoyed having you on the show. Thanks for doing this with us. Uh, as far as everybody else listening, you can find the podcast, the show, everything we're doing online on, on Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, Spotify, all the different places. Uh, you can go on YouTube and see the beautiful blonde locks of Ned here uh, and enjoy that view in your shop while you're working. Uh, and uh, until the next time, guys, appreciate you. Peace.